Thank you. Uh, first of all, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is John Richmond. I'm the Business Development Manager for Park Sigling, and I have been for the past three and a half years now. So today, what I want to talk about is give you an idea of some of the developments that we're working on with regards to IP-enabled token working systems. I think probably worthwhile before that, just giving you a little bit of background on who we are and indeed what we do. So Park Sigling traditionally uh, have been mainly involved in SSI Sigling uh, and improvements to or updates to being able to access the data, process the information you can from there to give you monitoring and maintenance solutions on there. So traditionally we started off building such products as you can see here. Uh, on the left hand side you see our Remit Detect product which is there for uh, monitoring uh, the interlockings and the data links coming off those. We have our Remos equipment in the middle which helps with fault finding once you're out on site, uh, trackside functional mod modules, that kind of thing. And also elements that help out on stabilizing the data links and uh, reducing interference on them to improve the reliability of the signaling system. So to the right of the slide, you can see our uh, data link isolating transformer and our isolating transformer there, both of which are used extensively out on the, uh, the railway system as we speak. More recently, probably about the past five to 10 years, we've started looking into how we can incorporate our engineers know-how on signaling and communications and control systems, uh, not just to update uh, things on a like-for-like -like basis, but also to use new technologies, uh, the latest information technologies, IP, all these kind of things to improve on systems that are that out there at the moment. They've been working successfully for quite a long time now, but are perhaps becoming more uh, obsolete and very difficult to maintain or update going forwards. Uh, one example we have here on screen now is our replacement for the uh, technician's terminal, which has been very successful. We've sold quite a few of these out there, and this replaces the old DOS-based system, uh, which has been used for the past 20 odd years. So we had a great deal of success, success with that. Uh, but as we've been thinking about these kind of uh, projects, projects and programs, we've started looking into how we can actually apply that to some other systems that are out there on the railway. So on the left hand side here you can see uh, what we've developed as a replacement for your normal data link modules which are obviously connected together via copper cable. Uh, this can cause interference in a number of areas uh, due to obviously the properties of having the copper cables there, uh, always a risk of theft etc. Uh, therefore we developed with our so colleagues in Australia the optical data link module which is something there's a light for light plug and play replacement which can be used initially on the copper if you've still got copper in there but can also then be, for, be used by optical fibers linking together the data link modules so that gives a lot better uh, resistance from interference and reduces the risk of copper theft uh, on the right hand side again it's some innovative thinking we've started looking into what we can do to reduce the risk at user work level crossings it's a big issue for the industry and what we developed here is gate lock which is a very low cost system to actually probably improve the safety of these crossings by a great deal probably 70 80 percent something like that but in looking at what we've been doing on removing copper based systems and connecting items together via copper and looking at something a bit more up to date has led us on to what we're here to talk about today which is our dive lock system which is the picture you can see there in the center of the screen So what does die block replace? Well, historically, uh, token working, key token working has been uh, operational in the railway industry for certainly well over 100 years, and it's still in operation out there today. Uh, the pictures on the screen here, I did consider about whether or not to run this as a quiz with answers given at the end of the session as to what these machines were. But in order for, to actually progress on with this, you can see on the left hand side, we have the uh, machine from Glen Willey on the Strand Rail Line. Uh, in the centre, we have a railway signalling company token machine, which was in place at Ambergate Junction until very recently. Uh, and on the right, we have a tyres number 12 machine, which is more reminiscent of what, what people think of as a key token machine, uh, which is obviously still out there operating on the railway today. In fact, there are well over 100 of these operating out there. 
So these machines have been in place, as I say, for over 100 years in a lot of cases. They're becoming, as they're mechanical machines, they're becoming more and more worn, difficult to maintain. And also, as they're connected together by copper cables, they're both expensive to maintain and install, but also subject quite easily to theft, which can reduce, obviously, get rid of the signaling system there. So what we've done here at Park Signaling is we've de developed our own version here, but based on IP principles. So what you have here are two examples of our digital block controller. As you can see, they look quite familiar. This was done deliberately so that it minimizes any training issues that you may have with both drivers and with signalers. Uh, the machines look the same as far as the drivers and signalers are concerned, they operate the same, but there are some added key advantages on there. Uh, at the end of the presentation today, if there's time, we'll be showing you a short video which just gives you an idea of how these actually work in operation and how simple it is for drivers and for signalers to adapt to these. So really, what is key token uh, system? What's the die block system concept about? Well, in effect, you could have uh, a key token working is that it gives a physical token, which therefore gives a driver the authority to enter a particular section of line, and that protects normally signal line sections between passing loops. There's only one token, so its possession signifies the line is clear. That would be a very simple system. That can be carried out by staff or something like that. Now, electronic token machines, like the ones you've seen earlier, they allow two or more trains to travel in the same direction over a single line, one after each other. So that gets rid of the problem of having to get the token back from one end of the section to the other. So what, how that works is a stationary token machine is positioned at both ends of the section, and they both have a bank of identical tokens located within them. The machines communicate, and they ensure that only one token can be released at any time, and that ensures the safety of the section. In effect, you can only have one train in section at any one time. So how that operates, the train will remove a token from the machine, travels along that in a single line section, and then replaces it into a second machine. Now another train can actually pass over that section and do that quite safely. You can actually have situations where there's another line comes off in the middle of a single line section. So, for example, you might have a freight siding going into a, a petrochemical plant, something like that. So you can have auxiliary unit in the middle of those single single token sections, single line sections. Uh, physical token there would normally be used to unlock the ground frame as well and operate any other equipment on there. So really, the electronic token block instruments and therefore die block as an updated version of that can operate in a number of modes these can be categorized probably into two main modes one is signal release required and one is no signal release required now we've developed our ip system our ip uh, machine die block to be able to be compatible with all mode workings that are out there on the network at the moment so for example you might have here a signal release required mode where you have a signal box at one end of the section and a key token machine locked away in a cabinet uh, at another location. So as described earlier, the, dri the driver of the train will go there, take the, take the key token to the top of the uh, machine, request, press the request to uh, release, token, release token button. The signal will then release that request and then we'll actually press the button to allow that to be released. The driver can then take the token out and proceed over the single line section. They will then return the token once they get through that section into the to the signaler. In this case, so same requirement, uh, signal release required. But this can be where you've got a signal box at the end of each section. So the principle is exactly the same. But rather than the machine being on the platform, the signaler will have the machine there. So here we mentioned before is the other mode that's available, and that's the no signaler mode. Uh, this gets a bit more complicated in the number of machines that you have there because you're having to remotely access and return tokens individually. And the system setup you have here allows passage in both directions. So what we can do with the machines, we can configure them to whatever scenario, whatever layout there is at a certain location, and make sure that the machines mirror that and operate accordingly. So, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we have a section here where you've got an intermediate token machine. Uh, that shows here you've got three machines in there. 
exactly the same way. They'll be configured uh, by Park Sigling to operate in that mode from the information given us to, uh, to us by the infrastructure owner. And we'll go on to a bit later on how that's actually managed and communicated. So, uh, looking at what advantages, the key advantages that the, uh, the die block system has over the traditional key token machines that are wired in, uh, there's no cabling required. So you don't have the copper cable traveling between the token machines. You don't have the risk of theft. You don't have the risk of damage or degradation of that, or the expense of laying and maintaining that. Uh, it's all done via comms. So as long as you've got access to comms of any type, it's gonna be 2G, 3G, 4G, FTN, fiber, whatever it is, it will work on that. The machines themselves are standardized. It's the programming that goes into them, which actually configures them for a particular location. So in effect, they're, they're plug and play. You, you can keep a, a spare unit in storage and you just have to configure it through an SD card, which I'll come on to later on, if we need to take one of the machines away for maintenance or for any other reason. Now you can control up to six, you can have up to six machines in one group that can configure for complex situations. So you can have six die block machines all linked together uh, and the logic will follow whatever the logic needs to be for operation of the signaling on that location. One key advantage that we have with this machine over the other machines is we have a channel for remote condition monitoring. Now at the moment, the first thing you really know if there's a problem with a key token machine is if it fails. What we can do through remote condition monitoring, we have a dedicated channel separate from the communications channels, which gives remote condition monitoring information. So that can give you an early alert should there be a problem about to happen or can enable you to monitor trends and usage over time. An important part of the machine that we've done here is that it's compatible with the existing equipment. So you don't need to purchase any new key tokens. It operates with all four types of standard key token. Uh, we can, of course, supply new ones if required. And here, I think the last point here is a very, very important point because this has been a problem on a few occasions out there on the network is that currently when you have a signal of release and you've got more than two machines linked together on that section, the signal of release releases all the machines in that section on the existing system. And that has led to incidents where someone's mistaken the position that they're at and has taken, machine out of the wrong, uh, taken a token out of the wrong machine. With Diablock, this cannot happen. It's configured so that that is an impossibility. So a number of sections as well, you'll have on certain sections where there's a lot of traffic in one direction, it's predominantly in one direction. Now what you can end up with that uh, is there's a lot of tokens at one end and none at the other end of the system. So what we've included in compatibility with our new dial block machine is with the physical magazines there, which enable uh, signaling technicians to take a, chunk, a number of tokens out of a machine and transport them back to the other end. So dial block is fully, fully compatible with that. Uh, as mentioned before, it's compatible with all four types of existing key token, and we can supply new key tokens if required. So one of the big things about the, the machine when we looked at the design of this is that we've looked to try and use off-the-shelf components wherever possible to keep costs down and to prevent obsolescence occurring. So as you can see, that's an industry standard uh, connector there uh, on the back of the multi-way multi connector there. That's where all the functionality goes through. As you see towards the bottom of the machine, you can see three ethernet ports. Now, one and two are for your diverse routing of comms. So that gives you two communication paths between that and the other machine, which give you diversity on there. So those communication paths can be anything, any type of comms that's out there. It can be Wi-Fi, it can be say 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, fiber to network, FTN, all these kind of things, public networks. All these things are, are compatible with the system. And both outputs can be a different. So you could have one on 3G, one on 4G. You could have one with one carrier, one with a different carrier. This can handle all those kind of situations. And as long as one of those two uh, communication routes is open, the machines will work. Now, what you can see there as well, is a third ethernet port, and that's a separate one for the remote condition monitoring. So that comes out on a separate circuit, completely independent of the communication circuits there. So there's no risk of any information being moved over incorrectly on there.
So when we look at the external interfaces here, you can see this is for the this looks at the remote condition monitoring on there, and just gives you an idea of how how the uh, how it's wired up on there. So it gives you an idea of some of the the common faults that we think would be wanted to be monitored on there. But these can be configured according to what the customer would want. So that's just a general little wiring diagram which shows you how that's actually managed within the unit. Now also look at the external interfaces. Now these are the communications interfaces which are the key uh, outputs and inputs between the two token machines or more depending on how the setup is. So the key ones you have in inhibit system release input, token locally removed outputs and totally, token locally returned outputs. So these are all duplicated on there for, for safety and security. They're all double cut. Uh, and there's a lot of the work has been put into the architecture of this to make it robust and to make sure that it's safe and complies with the relevant standards on there. I won't go into too much depth on that, but obviously it just gives you an indication of the thought that's gone behind that over the years of developing this system. What our machine can also do is can cope with things such as points uh, TPWS inhibit and such like. So, for example, you may have a section single line uh, when the token backs it goes in or token is taken out, you may want it to inhibit TPWS. Our machine is fully capable of undertaking that functionality. So, I mentioned, uh, I've gone back one too many there. We mentioned here before about how we can actually configure the the units. And I mentioned about that you'd be able to have one spare. Uh, if you have an issue with one, you can just take one out of store or get one from us, uh, configure it locally, and then take it outside to do a plug and play replacement. So configuration is taken from the data for that area via SD card, and there are ports on the machine to enable, in, enable that machine to be configured for the particular location. So what this does mean is you can't get any confusion there. If you were to have a number of sections with these machines in, you took one out and returned it to the long, wrong section, you'd know straight away because it wouldn't work. So everything is configured for the specific location and it's traceable that way and managed that way. So just a little bit on the actual interfaces and actually how the machine is, is constructed and configured on the insides. The, the old machines were all mechanical, uh, lots of uh, bolts, mechanical information in there, very heavy, very uh, difficult and intense to maintain. With ours, it's mainly electronical with some physical attributes such as the commutator in the shot bolt. So these have been ex uh, extensively trialled and developed, and we're confident that these will last for the lifetime of the machine. This here, as part of the architecture, is key to how the machine works and how you can actually do signaling safely over IP rather than via physical connections. So as you can see from here, everything is duplicated. So we have the, the safety side of things and the non-safety side of things. The non-safety side of things are your outputs to your ethernets. So they are all managed by a non-safety processor and that is kept separate, it's isolated from the rest of the systems on there with only particular inputs there to the safety processor. So everything that comes out of that has already gone through the safety processor. So nothing can pass that way into the actual signaling equipment without having first had its safety validation checked. As I say, as long as one side's working, the system will work. But by having the double uh, proof in there, it actually gives you that integrity that the system will always operate in a fail safe situation. So just really looking at how things are made, we actually make these within the group. Uh, they are metal, they're not plastic or anything at all like that. So they're robust uh, and they do look very similar to existing machines. Uh, there's an example of our designed and in-house built circuit board for this. So we've done a lot of work on this, currently going through network rail uh, approval on there, which we hope to get very, very soon for this process and this product. Uh, but this is something we've developed over a number of years. We've had a number of different versions of this before we've actually got something which we believe is production ready. So as I mentioned before, uh, we can use whatever type of comms you have out there. 
So this is just a, a, a little diagram just showing you how potentially things will, could be connected up over 4G. So quite simple, easy to install. Uh, the idea is it can go over public networks. It doesn't have to be a dedicated network. The integrity and the encoding of the data on there is such that it can go over public networks. So that's really all I want to present to you today at this stage. Uh, everything we've done on there, just so as you know, the standard that we've used for this is EN 50159 is the key to actually this, which is the Railway Applications, Communications, Signaling, um, Processing Systems, Safety Related Communications in Transmission Systems. So the dive lock system is actually fully compatible with that. And we look forward to seeing it hopefully on trial with Network Rail very soon. Uh, we do have a short video now to show you, which is actually a training video we've produced for Network Rail. Uh, and then hopefully after that, we can answer any questions that you may have. So Mildred, if you could show that, that'd be great. Hopefully that should start any moment. Apologies, I'm experiencing some technical issues. Okay. So, so John, I think if we uh, can we share the link to the uh, to the video, and perhaps if we go over to the question Q and A now, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, that's fine. I'll leave. Uh, I've got a link specifically for it, but I'll leave Milda look, working on that. But yes, more than happy to take any questions at this stage. Okay. Well, th thank you for. Uh, um, you know, a fa description of a fascinating, I'm sure it's an absolutely fascinating project, but I know it's it's typical of the kind of work that park, park signaling uh, do. We, you'll be pleased to know we've got a, a number of questions. Um, so um, in, right, let's, let's have a look then. Um, so um, the, I think you've got your gate lock system. So this is not about uh, uh, die block. Your gate lock okay. system, is that, is that approved by Network Rail at this stage? It's not approved at the moment, no. We do have a trial site for that. Uh, things have obviously been slowed down a little bit due to the coronavirus, but that trial site should be going live uh, within the next few months. Okay, Ex Okay. excellent. Sounds like you've got somebody interested in that. The question was from Paul McSharry. Um, the um, my colleague Richard asks: Does the loading uh, does loading the configuration data memory card become a safety critical operation? And his his thinking there is about the issues about reloading safety critical data that was experienced on the Cambrian ETCS implementation. In fact, the, the, the it shouldn't be safety critical as such because the data will be in, supplied to us and will have actually undertaken the, the verification of that data on the card so it should be able to be done by a signaling technician i believe uh but we can look into that in more depth i'm not sure 100 percent on that but i believe it's kept as a quite a simple operation on that can be done by a technician i think i think i guess the question the root of the question is um were it to be uh not uploaded for instance or wrongly uploaded would the system fail safe it would absolutely yes so for the system to work both obviously you've got at least one you've got at least two machines there so they'll have to be talked together so if the configuration is out on one or even both of those machines then it wouldn't work okay thank you so s s another question here software and data development sounds critical so is the software and data sil4 um, uh, iso50128 compatible uh yes i believe it's i can't remember if it's sil3 or sil4 but it's to the relevant standard that uh, we were okay. informed by network where it needed to be up. Yeah, and a good question here. Um, what? Uh, well, it, I'll blend two questions together here. Um, are you able to give an idea of, appro of approval times for die block, which I'm guessing is when do you think you'll be able to have it in service? So, that, and I'll, I'll ask. I'll, I'll ask the second question in a moment. Yeah, sure. So we've been undertaking product approval with Network Rail over the past year or so. Uh, 18 months. We're very close now. Uh, there were some issues from cyber security. Uh, I think they didn't really understand how the product worked. So we've been trying to educate them 
on the, on the fact that it is safe and, and does meet with all the relevant criteria on there. Uh, we're hoping to have a trial site out this year uh, with approval to follow either end of this year or very early next year. But we are pushing to get that through as soon as possible. And also we're looking at trialling this out on uh, non-network rail sites, so it's available for heritage railways as well. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, so the, the related question was, um, from your experience, what are your top tips for uh, getting a product approved? What are the sort of things that you would recommend people think about? I think the thing is, is to from from day one when you're looking at uh, developing a product, is think about the what's going to be required for product approval on there. So understanding what's required, what the requirements of the, the process are, should form a key part in development of the product. And also involving uh, network rail product approvals from an early stage and uh, building that relationship. If you start from an early stage and take them along on the journey with you, then you'll find that they'll be a big help to you. Uh, that's certainly the experience that we've had. Okay, thank you. And presumably there was pull for, from network rail and similar clients for that product, given the obsolescence of the original block instruments, was there? Uh, well, it, in effect, this actually came through from a, a university product a project by one of our members of staff. So it was generated as an idea. Uh, there wasn't really a lot of pull to start off with until we approached Network Rail probably about six years ago to say we have this idea as a concept. Uh, since then, since that time, the actual repair has become a bit more difficult to undertake on that. So certainly now, yes, there is a lot of pull from Network Rail to get this ready and into service. OK, thank you. So, John, there's, there's a characteristic around your uh, products which might make them suitable for the challenge that the DFT have put out there at the moment about reopening closed lines or, or low cost, low yes. cost reopenings or low cost new lines. What are your thoughts about how we can, as an industry, keep the signaling costs down on those kind, kind of routes? I think there's a number of things that we can do on there. Certainly within part, we this is only one of the low cost uh, signaling solutions that we've been looking at. We have uh, a VLS system, very low cost signaling, which works on RFID tags and GPS positioning, which could be useful again for a light usage railway on there. It involves no physical signaling, only unpowered RFID tags and then a computer once on board a rail vehicle. Uh, die block, the technology behind it doesn't have to actually output into a physical machine. So the encryption technology and transmission technology behind it could be used in a way whereby it transmits to a driver's display on a train. So again, you could potentially have on a, a branch line reopening, you could have this type of system uh, in place and in effect, it'll be signal free. So we have a number of ways that we can do that. And I think the industry needs to be more innovative. Network Rail needs to consider that signaling can be a very, very expensive cost in reopening lines and probably disproportionately so in a lot of cases. So I think they really need to in, in, you know, talk to the industry, ourselves and other partners on there to look at innovation in signaling really, because there are ideas out there that can help. Well, hot, hot news, uh, following a, a challenge from Andrew Haynes on a, a, a rear coronavirus conference call last week at Friday, I think it was, uh, he raised the issue that he wanted to identify ways of helping DFT, well, frankly, spend their money to reopen reopen these lines. Um, and so within RIA, um, I've picked up the, the challenge to do something, I don't know, it could be perhaps a little bit like the electrification cost challenge we, we did. So I'll be engaging with members uh, to try and elicit the ideas around that so that we can give something back to industry. So, so watch this space. Um, I think that neatly brings us to uh, the end of that time slot, John. Um, so if you can imagine a virtual round of applause, I'd like to thank you very much for your, your, your presentation and uh, for answering the questions. I'm sure everybody knows where you are if there's any uh, follow-up questions. So many thanks again for on behalf of everybody on the call. Um, if you could uh, um, mute yourself and uh, drop the camera, that would be great. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks, John. Key token instruments have been in use throughout the world for over 100 years. Park signaling have developed a new version, 
The concept of operation is the same. A driver must be in possession of the correct key token to enter the section of line. Key token instruments control access to the keys. A token available and token not available indicate if a key can be released. Fault indicators are for the maintainer's use. When the signal instructs you to, press Request Token and then when the machine indicates a key can be released with a continuous tone, rotate a key out of the machine. The key matches the section so the train can proceed. After confirming the train is complete and clear of the section, the key can be rotated into the machine. Ensure the key is moved down and not left in the keyhole. To release a key token, press Request Token and then when the machine indicates a key can be released with a continuous tone, rotate a key out of the machine. In certain systems, the driver needs the signaler to give permission before they can remove a key. When given verbal permission, the driver presses Request Token. The signaler then must press Signaler's Release before the driver can remove a key. Never attempt to force or override a key token instrument. Never surrender a key unless your train is complete and clear of the section. Never enter a key token control section of line without the correct key token. Get the signaler's permission before attempting to remove a key token. Do not leave a key in the keyhole.